Okay, folks, so I want to share this issue here of uh, the American Journal of Civil Defense. I mean, this is high quality propaganda here, folks. They put out several of these issues dating back to 1968. And uh, this one here is volume one, number four, from 1968, uh, showing the blast resistant cable routes back when they were under still, you know, still under construction. But it's just kind of interesting to me, these periodicals like this. I mean, this is high quality propaganda here. Every one of these issues, I swear, is. But it's just kind of curious to me, you know, there's a lot of this talk, of course, about global warming and all that and what's causing it. And then, you know, I just, when I look at information like this, where they're talking about, you know, this is a typical communications control center under construction. Once it's con uh, construction is completed, earth is backfilled around the walls of the building and over its top. In this case, a gently slipping hill will cover the structure and help to give it the required blast protection. And, you know, burying these cable lines and all these communication lines, of course, was all part of, you know, hardening our communication lines and our systems against nuclear blasts. And here they show a cable stretch cross country from one communication center to another. The above Western electric cable is being laid across the Mojave Desert in California. I mean, look at the fucking trench there. I mean, and they strung these cables all over the entire planet, folks. And new facilities are planned using these innovations to provide maximum service continuity. There's that keyword, continuity. But these are only additions to an existing network that strongly promotes survivability through use of route diversity, alternate route switching, restoration procedures, automatic line switching, and emergency power, etc. Coaxial cable systems most economically meet present demands for additional circuits where there are large requirements, where there is the need for facilities that will be compatible in the next decade with communication systems now under development and where maximum continuity is required. So again, this depiction here shows a buried amplifying station such as this one dot every cross country cable at close intervals. Access for maintenance personnel is through a manhole at the top. Here's uh, this one that's showing a uh, shock mounted equipment is standard in all control centers. Note heavy duty springs above, ready to absorb ground shock. I think that's these black pads here is what they're saying. It says shock mountings artificially colored. So I'm assuming that's what these are like that. So, I mean, when you, when you buried these cables and did all of this stuff, laid down miles and miles and miles of cabling systems, and, you know, it, it heats up after a while, right? I mean, this stuff... When you're flowing all kinds of information through these cable systems and these cable lines, there's energy and there's heat that builds up, folks. This is kind of curious. Inside of the Washington Monument, workmen lower cover on a precast manhole in which telephone amplifying equipment is installed for the branch line into Washington from the Boston to Miami coaxial cable. So you got these things, these control stations and these installations that are buried all across the United States, folks. And um, there is a... Yeah, this is it here. This is one of the maps that's showing the underground cabling systems, actually the underwater ones that are out over the oceans and everything. And it's no wonder that the oceans are heating up. It's no wonder that we're heating up. It, it really, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there were people that had thought this through before all of this stuff was laid out and planned and everything. But try opposing, you know, these countries that want to build these heavy duty, you know, cable construction lines. I'm willing to bet that there was opposition to this. I'm willing to bet that back then there were scientists and professionals that were coming forward and saying, wait a minute, um, you know, these cabling systems generate power and electricity and they also generate heat. Don't you think after a while we could have some issues with that? You know, I mean, so this whole push for solar and to put these things in these power systems up in the upper atmosphere, it, I believe has got everything to do with this older cabling system that they've had in place for decades. And, you know, they've realized, yeah, we're, we're heating stuff up here. <laughs> we're doing things that's causing, you know, ripple effects from all these cabling systems that are buried underground. And now you got um, Hawaii out here begging for them to bury the cable lines out underneath in their island and everything. But folks, you need to realize, and I'm sure that there's engineers and people that have already pointed this out to some of these people that live in Hawaii. They're just too ignorant to really understand. This, These are volcanic islands. I mean, you're talking about burying cables in volcanic rock. This is not going to be an easy task if that's really what they want. And I'm pretty certain that they've already got some cabling systems out there. I guarantee you that every one of these little islands has got their own little underground installation and their control station that's well protected, well, well guarded and hardened. And 
you know, as far as this whole solar thing, you know, the government is not going to go solar, folks. None of these governments and these military agencies are going to go solar. They're not going to be putting on, uh, putting up all of these satellite systems and relying on space power systems, on satellite systems and power systems and power stations that are based up in the upper atmosphere. They're just not. Because when you really think about it, if the, one of the major threats that we face um, is like another Carrington event, which on a side note, I got to say, folks, I'm willing to bet that that situation, that event, and what they call the Carrington event, was not something like what they say. I think it was a very bad accident. I think they were already playing around with solar power. They were already playing around with all of this free energy and Tesla technology and everything years ago. And I'm willing to bet there was probably a very large landmass right out here. And they fucked around and they did something they shouldn't have done. And it caused a, a devastating effect on the planet. And this whole thing with solar power is not new, folks. It's an older technology that was already explored and invested in in other countries even. So the, the bigger push that they're giving us now to get us off of these hard lines is it's so that they can, you know, they can continue their process. They can do their jobs and continue their governmental jobs and their governmental responsibilities um, because they're going to be on the hard lines and they want all the civvies off of them hard lines and they want all the civvies on those satellite systems and on those temporary power systems and i'm calling them temporary power systems because there's nothing sustainable about putting nuclear power plants up in the upper atmosphere on your planes nothing sustainable about that whatsoever in fact i believe that makes us even more vulnerable so i just i this whole thing with global warming i have no doubt that we're heating up I mean, we've had these underground cabling systems stringing through the continents for decades. It's bound to have heated up. And I'm willing to bet that it's probably triggered a few fault lines. It's if not created fault lines when they've dug through. I mean, if you look at all the fault lines that are all throughout this whole area here, in order to supply, you know, these cabling systems out here to the Pacific, you're going to have to have multiple substations out throughout this whole coastal area here to feed those lines. So... You know, this whole coast is probably full of a bunch of those little installations and substations and everything like that that's transferring energy and it's heating up. And I'm willing to bet that there were incidents and accidents and things where some of these, you know, trenches that they dug created devastating effects on the geography and on the land. So I just said not everything is what they say it is. I'm really fully believe that there was something much bigger out here where Hawaii was at one time and they fucked it up because they were testing solar energies and Tesla technology years and years ago, decades ago. And now they're trying to get it installed back again, but maybe that's their attempt to mitigate. And I do got to wonder on some of these days when we see all of this spraying going on and all of this haze, if they aren't attempting to mitigate any kind of fallout that might be coming down from the upper atmosphere when they're testing their, you know, weapon systems, you know, I don't know. Some of these are pretty curious. This was another one. Uh, this was volume seven, issue six from 1974. Survive the American Journal of Civil Defense. Yeah. And uh, it, there was an interesting article here um, about relocation. And uh, where do we stand on crisis relocation planning? This was the director for defense and civil preparedness agency. This is this is propaganda fluff. This is intended to make people feel good about certain things, right? But I tell you what, folks, the thought of relocation does not appeal to me whatsoever. And I I think that this engineered drought that they have out here, I think they were hoping, hoping that people would just leave on their own and just abandon the territory out here. But, you know, that just, there's a lot more to this whole global warming thing than what's been mentioned. And as far as um, creating disaster zones, and these relocation planning projects and things, this isn't anything new either, folks. The stuff with these crisis relocation planning operations and events, they have their little practice runs and their exercises all the time where they're practicing what to do with these events like this. And if we have something very large pop up here in the U.S., um, I don't know. Um, there's just, there's too many questions as to motives for you know, some of the policies and some of the rules and regulations that are being made now, as far as people being able to build your own shelters or being able to plan your own relocation type of a situation. From what I've understood anyway, with some of these wildfires and things that have been going on out in California, even if you don't follow their rules, you know, you, you don't get shit. You just take a bite and you take a loss, if not the loss of life. 
and these people in charge of these systems don't give a shit. But again, I just I thought this is just kind of curious. There's a number of these volumes and issues here dating back to the you know the 60s and through the 70s that are just really curious because this is we're talking high quality propaganda here, folks. With the, the American Journal of Civil Defense's publication called Survive. But anyway, yeah, if we've got some global warming and stuff going on, it's no wonder when you bury all of those cables and all that shit down there, you're asking for it. And as far as the solar, just be, be careful how we're trying and moving forward with this whole solar power thing and Tesla tech and Tesla energy um, projects, because I'm, I'm just, I think that we were, we were subjected to some intense energies and stuff a few years ago as well, which I think was part of that testing. There's very large, um, solar array fields down here to the south of our location where um that big line of energy came in and i you know i think we were subjected to a test i think they possibly could have been testing these solar fields by blasting it with a fucking man-made emp and it this is right where it came right down in it would have it would have covered this whole end of the valley if not some of lake mead as well which is probably why it, it, which is what probably contributed to some of this drying up as well engineered drought look it up folks it's in the military's documents in their own patents where they talk about using nuclear detonations to to cause drought to engineer drought because when think about it even when you microwave stuff what what is the process of a microwave oven do it boils out the water it heats by boiling out the water so you microwave an area of land in a region of land it's going to dry out and it's going to dry out fast depending on the yield so and i know i've stated it so many times but because I'm repetitive, I got to say it again. I very firmly believe we were subjected to a, a big test like this back in 2018. And I don't consent. I still don't consent. That's not going to change. I guarantee it. None of They wouldn't be able to present me with any kind of science whatsoever that would ever justify them creating an EMP or a microwave weapon and, and using it and deploying in overpopulated areas. No science will justify that ever in my mind, never. And uh, it would be nice in my lifetime if I could really find answers for what that was that we were subjected to back in 2018.